Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about UAB joining a players association and kind of what that effect might have coming down the road. I'm a big favor of player associations, but I'm sure there will be a lot of people that are against me on that. So we'll, we'll figure out how that goes and definitely a ton more to unpack there. But let's go to the transfer portal for the time being and let's talk about uh, what's going on. Um, there has been a ton of movement over the last couple of days. The portal is officially closed, so that has wrapped up. Although grad transfers do have until I believe midnight tonight to enter their name, but a lot of the big names are um, set where they are, uh, whether that's in the portal or committed to somewhere else or staying where they are. Um, but there are a couple of teams that came out a little bit unscathed. Mainly, I believe Georgia didn't have really much of anyone leave that was super important. Um, Alabama took some hits towards the end that we'll get here um, in a second. But Definitely kind of the big dogs came out okay, and uh, some other teams got hit, which is exactly the way that we kind of saw this unfolding. Now, I thought it would be a little bit more hectic, but uh, we ended up getting a little bit of a, a quieter than I thought, uh, although it was not necessarily quiet by any means. But let's first get to some commitments, and then we'll get to some intel some, uh, for some of the guys that are still in the portal. Um, Ja'Cory Brown, a quarterback out of uh, Miami, has found his way to UCF, and that is a team we will be talking about quite a bit on this segment because they have been doing absolute work out there. Gus Malzahn has been doing incredible stuff in Orlando and has been bringing in some big-time guys with a couple more um, that he has his eyes set on, but Ja'Cory Brown, I think, is a fantastic fit for this offense. You saw John uh, Race Plumley do it a year ago where it was a very, you know, run-heavy, athletic, let-the-quarterback-go-out-and-do-his-thing type offense. Ja'Cory Brown just takes that to the next level. Um, he's going to be incredible now. I don't know if he's the starter, depending on how quickly he can pick up the playbook and get on the field. But I know for a fact that if you want Gus Malzahn's offense run well, you need someone like Ja'Cory Brown at the stick. So I think it'll be really interesting to watch that unfold. Um, Tad Hudson is a, a quarterback from North Carolina that was a very highly touted kid coming out of high school that just never really caught on at North Carolina. There was obviously um, some interesting things that happened in the transfer portal. Bringing in Max Johnson probably didn't give him as much uh hope I suppose that he was going to be the starting guy um, so he found a new place to play he ends up at Coastal Carolina I think it's a fantastic pickup not only for Coastal Carolina but for him I think whether or not he starts this year is kind of irrelevant to me I think he's someone that can be a starter for three years for them kind of the Grayson McCall type of things whether he finds his way back up to the ACC I don't know but I do think he's someone that could have a very very good career in the group uh, in the G5 and possibly be a guy that we're talking about as a late round draft pick uh, a couple years down the road here um, and then Jacoby Criswell when we talk about North Carolina quarterbacks he was a guy that was a North Carolina quarterback for quite some time found his way to Fayetteville for a year before finding his way right back to North Carolina I'm sure that was a little bit of an awkward conversation he had to have with Mac Brown but it seems like he has found his way back to North Carolina will likely sit behind Mac Johnson as we talked about for a year but then he, this kid can absolutely hit the ground running. I think this is a very, very talented kid. I think he has a ton of ability, um, both with his legs and with his arm. Now, the first run at North Carolina didn't necessarily go the way that you would have loved, but the door is much more open than it was uh, while he was there. So I think he's someone that could definitely help them out with the run game, but also just be a huge uh, piece for them, understand the offense and kind of uh, get them moving a little bit up there in Chapel Hill. But I don't necessarily think it'll be this year, but at least you have someone in the wings that you know you feel confident in if you are Mac Brown and you have to send him out there. Um, Devon Booth, a running back from Utah State, has committed to Mississippi State. They had to replace Rashad Amos, uh, who came from Miami of Ohio, before finding his way to Colorado. So just an idea of what this transfer portal window looked like. But uh, Jeff Levy has done a great job of handling all the craziness that has happened around him uh, as a first-time head coach. Obviously, this has been a very, very weird uh, portal cycle that he has found himself in. And Mississippi State is probably going to struggle for the majority of next year. But at the end of the day, um, Jeff Levy, at the very least, is showing that he can handle what uh, he has to handle as a coach in the power five as of right now in college football so a couple more back end guys here Ryan Yates the safety from uh, LSU has found his way to California 
this is a kid that has played a ton of football, just not necessarily has put out the greatest tape in the world, but I do think a change of scenery could be huge for him. I think Cal needs as many bodies as they can in the back end, and whenever you can get a guy from an LSU, uh, from a program like LSU, you never really hesitate, do you? Um, Ed Woods, a cornerback from Arizona State, has found his way to Michigan State. This is a big-time pickup for a team that is absolutely bleeding in the portal. So many guys walking out the door, especially across that defensive line, so definitely needed some help and uh, definitely needed uh, Jonathan Smith to uh, just smile a little bit, so definitely got him a little bit happier uh, yesterday, but Definitely a lot of guys leaving that program. It'll be a very interesting one to watch, but a huge pickup for them. And then you got Colton Hood, a cornerback from Auburn, who's found his way to Colorado. This was a bit of a twofer for the Buffs. They got uh, Colton Hood's younger brother, Brandon, who is a three-star uh, running back in 2024, to also commit. So works out for them both ways. You get a recruit, you get a guy that can impact uh, you right away. And I think this is a huge piece for them to help out with the back-end depth. He might actually be the guy that ends up starting cross from um, Travis Hunter. So we'll see what happens there, but definitely tons of uh, ability there and tons of football that he has played at a really high level, obviously, at the uh, in the SEC. But... Let's get to what this kind of looks like right now. And there's a couple of names still out there. Nick Evers, I haven't really heard much about him in the portal. I think he'll probably find his way to a group of five program, but who knows there. The running backs are still pretty much uh, absolutely loaded, but we started with the D-line last time, so why don't we start with a couple other positions and then we'll work our way down. Alabama took a little bit of a hit yesterday, and they took the hit where they absolutely could not afford to take it. Um, Peyton Woodyard is a very, very talented safety who was coming out of the 2024 class, was there for about three months, I guess, um, and then has found his way out of the program. I guess he gave you know the new regime a chance to uh, see what it was like. It wasn't for him, so he's finding a new place to play. It looks like Oregon is... The massive leader there definitely will be the team to beat, and I think this would be a huge pickup for him, uh, Dan Lanning, that is, and Oregon. I think this would be a guy that could be a three-year star, three year starter for your program and kind of command that defense on the back end. Not sure if he'll start his first year, but can definitely help them out down the road and be a huge part of that defense going forward. And then they also had Tony Mitchell find his way into the portal. This is probably the bigger of the two just because Tony Mitchell has a little bit more uh, football under his belt and has a little bit more understanding of the defense, but this is a big hit. I'm not sure exactly where he's leaning right now. I think there's a number of schools that will be after him. I think Texas is one to watch with this one because they need some help on that back end, and Tony Mitchell is a very, very talented player. Um... But we'll see what happens there. I think that's a tough loss for a position group and a position room that has already been gutted pretty good. Um, obviously lost a ton of guys to the portal, lost three guys to the NFL, so it's been tough uh, for the new um, DB coach over there, Maurice Lindquist, but they still have some guys in there that can absolutely give them some good uh, snaps. They just uh, are a little bit thinner than they're used to being. Um, and I talked about Texas with uh, Tony Mitchell, possibly. The reason for that is Terrence Brooks has found his way out the door. A very talented corner from Texas started for them last year, had a little bit of a tough moment in the spring game where Arch Manning had that uh, deep ball to start his day. But um, it looks like UTSA is the team that's kind of uh, emerging as the possibility for his next stop. This would be a very interesting situation, but I think it's something that could be happening more and more when you look around college football. This is a talented kid that absolutely could go to a Power 5 school. I have no doubt in my mind that there is someone in the Power 5 that would love to get this kid services. The question is, if he gets on that pro if he gets to that program, he has to learn the defense, would he be a starter right away? And would that team have the ability to play the number of games that UTSA could possibly play, right? When you look at the new college football playoff model, G5 team has to get in. UTSA is a very good team that is going to have a lot to say about that G5 team. So maybe he's just setting himself up to possibly play on a big stage against a big time team, whether that's at their home stadium or not. It doesn't necessarily matter. I think he's kind of playing this as I'm going to go to a smaller school. I'm going to be the best player on the defensive side of the ball and make tons of plays and show my athletic ability 
and possibly even make a playoff run if everything falls the way that um, he's hoping. So a very interesting move, something that I think we could see a little bit more down the road, especially with guys that might just be more comfortable in that state at this point and uh, might just want to stick around. So it'll be interesting to see that kind of develop, but it seems like UTSA could be getting a fantastic corner um, in Terrence Brooks. And then Jason Zandamella, a very, very talented interior offensive lineman that um, kind of the same way of Peyton Woodyard uh, from Bama was on campus in USC for about three months before finding his way out. It seems like this is a Florida UCF battle. I believe he is a Florida kid, so that makes total sense. I would lean towards Florida to win this one out, but UCF has been pulling off some stuff on the portal trail that uh, I'm not going to put anything by him by any means. I mean, one of the big things that I've seen develop over the last couple of days, Penny Boone, the very talented kid out of Toledo who... Seemed like he was going to Kentucky. It was all but signed that he was going to Kentucky. And then some academic things happened where he wasn't going to be able to transfer enough credit hours uh, for it to make sense and for him to graduate on time. So he's finding his way somewhere else. And it seems like UCF might be the leader there as well. And if you had Penny Boone and Ja'Cory Brown in uh, in the same backfield and you had a run game with them, it would be really, really tough to guard, I'll be honest with you. That would be an absolutely nasty read option that would have DNs and linebackers confused day in and day out. Um, But then finally, uh, for everyone but the D-linemen, Takario Davis has been a big-time name in this portal for quite some time. In fact, I still have his name on here. It should not be on here. Uh, He is someone that has decided to stay put in Arizona. Dwayne Aquina, the um, defensive coordinator there, was very, very optimistic that this would be the case, and it officially is a huge, huge thing for Arizona because they were bleeding a little bit in the portal, especially on the defensive side of the ball, so bringing back someone like Davis is absolutely huge for them. But let's get over to the D-linemen, and let's start with the edge. Um, uh, Tyler Barron is someone to watch over the next couple of weeks, a guy that was at Tennessee, committed to Ole Miss, then decommitted, found his way to Louisville, and now is back in the portal and is finding his way somewhere else. And it seems like the three teams to watch here are Miami, Ole Miss is back in the conversation, and then USC. I'm a little bit shocked that Ole Miss has decided to get back in that recruitment, but it seems like Miami might have the inside track here, but USC, I believe a visit is coming up for them pretty soon. So definitely one to watch. Guy could be an absolute game changer, especially for a team like USC that needs as much help on the defensive line as possible and they're hoping to get it on the interior as well. Derek Harmon is a guy from uh, Michigan State, one of the many guys that has found their way out of Michigan State, especially at that D-line position and it looks like he is kind of zeroing in on USC and Colorado. There have been teams like Oregon, Ohio State, Florida State, LSU, Miami were all kind of pushing for him But it doesn't seem like those are uh, catching up a lot of steam. So USC or Colorado feel like the team to watch. If you paired him with uh, Bear Alexander at USC, that's a pretty disgusting duo. I'll be totally honest with you. That, That could totally transform that defense and at least make them very stout against the run, which would be a huge plus for this defense and definitely would give them a massive leg up on where they were a year ago. So that's one that USC really needs to buckle down and hopefully get a commitment there. And then Dominic Williams, probably the biggest defensive tackle that is still on the board. Someone that we've talked about a little bit. It seems like it's a Texas OU battle, but LSU is pushing late very, very aggressively. Bo Davis needs uh, someone in that interior that is going to be a big-time player. And Dominic Williams is a NFL-level talent. He is someone that can absolutely turn into a remarkable player at that position. I would still lean Texas as of right this second, but... Who knows, this could go any number of directions, and I think that his commitment is coming down the barrel here pretty soon. It could be even today, Um, so we will update you on that probably tomorrow with some type of short or something, but if that does end up happening, but definitely a guy to watch, probably the most highly sought-after guy in the entire portal right now, if I had to imagine. So, tons going on. Uh, The portal has been absolutely insane. Not necessarily the craziness that I envision, but... Still plenty to go on, Um, still plenty to uh, unpack, and a couple of teams got hit very, very hard. Obviously, Michigan State, Colorado have been two teams that 
it feels like we're talking about a ton. Miami is a team that feels like they upgraded. UCF is kind of in the process of doing that as well. Tons of other teams have picked up guys here and there that will be very, very helpful. Um, another one that I want to talk about, actually, Elijah Badger seems like Florida is picking up steam more and more there. If they add him, I think him and Trey Harris or Trey Wilson, excuse me, would be a just remarkable duo for Graham Mertz and would make that Florida team even more interesting, which we'll get into probably on the next Spotlight Wednesday. But for this Spotlight Wednesday, we are going to talk about the Nebraska Cornhuskers. And there is so much going on around that program. There is so much pressure around that program. Let's be totally honest with each other. There is a lot of intense pressure around Matt Rule, around this team as a whole, but especially around Dylan Raiola. So I wanted to get to all of that, kind of unpack what I expect from Dylan Raiola, this offense, this defense, and um, how they're shaping up to be maybe a better team than people are prepared for Nebraska to be. But we'll get to all that right after this, so stick with us. <laughs> 